Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to chiefs, leaders, and health directors to this virtual town hall on which we'll be sharing a First Nations cancer screening update. I'm happy to be joining you today. My name is Nell Wyman. I'm originally from Mishiba Wittagong First Nation, which is in Treaty 5 territory, part of the Anishinaabe Nation. Uh, and I'm joining you today from where our offices are located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Squamish Nation. So thanks to you all for joining. The purpose of today's town hall is to provide new screening data for First Nations people in BC to First Nations chiefs, leaders, and health directors across the province, and to facilitate a space for the leaders to ask questions, share input, and create a shared understanding around this data. So before we start, uh, I just have a couple housekeeping items. You will see in the chat some instructions and on the screen uh, for Zoom housekeeping, how to change your name, for example, how to ask a question. Um, and if you have not already done so, please identify yourself uh, with your title and your Zoom name. Once we get through the opening uh, from our elder and some opening remarks, we'll go right into a presentation, which we have designated about 45 minutes for. So after the presentation is complete, then we will open up for questions and answers. So if you raise your hand halfway through the presentation, please note uh, whoever puts their hand up first, we will get to you following the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, we also have about 40 minutes for that question and answer period. Um, so you can raise your hands. If you require immediate support with Zoom, please see at the bottom of the slide, you can contact FNHA IT support at tim.ward at fnha.ca. And as noted, this uh, webinar is being recorded and this recording will be shared at a later time uh, on our FNHA website, as well as our YouTube channel. So as we begin, uh, we wanna open in a good way, and we're really fortunate to have Elder Sequalia with us uh, this afternoon to do so. So I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Sequalia. You're kindly muted, Sequalia. Hi, Ochton. I welcome you to the ancestral traditional territory of Squamish Okameok, my nation, Squamish nation, and I honor, acknowledge, and respect the ancestral territories of all the First Nation people that are gathered here today. Honor, acknowledge, and respect the First Nations territories where you live, work, and play. Sequalia Kwashaman Sna, my ancestral name, Sequalia. I'm also known as um, Ann Wanick. I'm just going to ask you all to come together, one heart and one mind, open your hands, let the energy flow, and I'll say, Chenkwa Mentomi Kakakanak Chesiam Yonsio Man Man Shkwalwin to Squiles to Seats, asking you, Creator, to watch over all the children gathered here today and help us all with our Shkwalwin feelings in our hearts and minds our total being emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual health and wellness. Asking you, Creator, to let us share the words we speak and listen to with Winoxus, respect, and be able to take a transfer of knowledge and information and be experience and be able to create positive solutions for the present and future. And asking you, Creator, let today be a yet one halt seats up an excellent work today. Toma Quetzi Snachem, those are my words. And I'm now going to turn you back over to Nell and um I'll rejoin you to do the closing. Thank you so much, Sequalia. And again, welcome to everyone. We've held this event today in partnership with UBC and BC Cancer to report back on First Nations cancer screening data in the spirit of, of upholding the First Nations data governance principles of ownership, control, access, and possession, OCAP. In my role as the watchman and data steward for First Nations people in BC, it is my responsibility to see and hear 
by observing, monitoring, and gathering information and data to capture the story of health and wellness of First Nations, as well as report back to communities. At the last town hall on the population health and wellness agenda, we heard concerns around cancer and screening. So this data and this town hall has come at a timely moment. Today, the FNHA Cancer and Wellness Chair, Dr. Nadine Caron, will be presenting data on breast cancer, cervical cancer, and colon cancer screening participation of First Nations people in BC. Warren Claremont and myself will also share on the ways in which FNHA and BC Cancer are working to improve cancer outcomes by improving access to services, hardwiring cultural safety and humility into the healthcare system, and improving community access to reliable information about cancer. But before we begin with the presentation, we'll have some opening remarks. First, uh, from Dr. Sheila Blackstock, who is the FNHA board chair. Sheila, I'll turn it over to you. Amiyav, thank you very much. I'm joining you today from the traditional unceded territory to Kamsakwapu. And I'd like to thank Sakalia for your opening uh, words and uh, your warm prayer today. I am the board of director chair of the First Nations Health Authority and a proud member of the Gitsan Nation um, from the Wilkes Gill uh, clan. And I'd like to uh, really extend and acknowledge each one of you and extend our gratitude to you for taking your time out of your busy schedules to join us today. I'm honored to welcome you to the town hall where we will hear, as uh, Dr. Nell Wyman mentioned, from the FNHA Cancer and Wellness Chair, Dr. Nadine Karan, and the BC Cancer Executive Director, Indigenous Health and Cultural Safety, Warren Clement, who is online with us as well. So in particular, Dr. Karan will be presenting data on breast cancer, cervical cancer, and colon cancer, screening participation of First Nations people in British Columbia. Warren Claremont will be presenting on what BC Cancer is doing to support our communities and how this data can inform a refreshed approach of Indigenous health cancer strategy. So for now, today, I'll keep my comments short so we can hear this important information and you will have time to ask your questions. As always, this is a safe space for chief leaders and health directors to ask your questions share input, and create a shared understanding around the data. So, Hamia, thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. We'll turn now to Wade Grant, who's the First Nations Health Council Chair. Wade? Uh, thank you, Dr. Wyman. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Blackstock. And I really want to thank my uh, dear relative, Sequalia, for uh, opening us up in the right way. I am... Um, I want to uh, introduce myself for those that uh, don't know who I am. My name is Wade Grant. Uh, my traditional name is Dalek and I am from the Musqueam Nation. I am the Vancouver Coastal South Coast Rep on the Health Council, First Nations Health Council, but I'm also the uh, the First Nations Health Council Chair. Uh, and I'm so, so pleased to be here on behalf of the Health Council uh, to support the Health Authority's work and discussion on the latest uh, cancer screening data. Uh, of course, when we uh, when we talk about uh, health data, we appreciate that we're talking about uh, very intimate uh, details about our people, our loved ones, uh, and their most important uh, details on their health and their wellness. Uh, we know that health data uh, can be used as an important tool uh, to help us find out uh, and find solutions uh, to make sure that BC First Nations people are doing better uh, and, and and will uh, be thriving in the future. Uh, we know that, that that we do know that this knowledge is power, and for too long that knowledge has hasn't been in our hands, uh, and we didn't have the access to the appropriate data on our health and wellness. But this is changing uh, now through the partnerships uh, between the First Nations Health Authorities, uh, the Chief Medical Officer Office, and the Provincial Health Office of BC. We do, we're beginning to have data that uh, are specific and relevant to BC First Nations. And uh, today's discussion is just one example of how we're working together uh, to transform the health system to help reclaim the health and wellness and well-being of First Nations in BC. Uh, we, you know, uh, just over a year ago, we, we came together at Gathering Wisdom and Chiefs took part in a historic vote to move forward with the 10-year strategy on the social determinants of health. 
and in improving, approving that strategy, Chiefs leaders directed the Health Council to consider how to support nation-level strength-based indicators and empower data sovereignty and, and governance. Uh, so the Health Authority is now considering how to align that work and the implementation of the 10-year strategy with the new population health and wellness agenda that will be discussed today. Uh, the First Nations Health Court Council, uh, the First Nations Health Authority, and the First Nations Health Directors Association, as well as our BC uh, government partners, share a vision of healthy, self-determining, vibrant First Nations children, families, and communities uh, right across British Columbia. And this recent ca cancer screening data will help us measure progress towards that vision as we continue to implement the 10-year strategy. So I want to thank each and every one of you for taking out your time today uh, to, to participate in this very important town hall, and I look forward to the discussion. So I'll turn it over to you again, Dr. Wyman, and uh, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Wade, for those opening remarks. And last but not least, we'll turn to Keith Marshall, who's the president of the First Nations Health Directors Association. Keith? Thank you, Dr. Wyman, and good day to everyone. Um, I want to thank Sequali. It was good to hear your voice again for opening us and gathering in a good way with your powerful words. I also want to recognize the community, the nations of Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam people who are the traditional caretakers of these lands. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories where each of the First Nations are collectively gathered today. And also to acknowledge the loss of loved ones, elders, youth, parents, aunts and uncles, and knowledge keeper to the illness like cancer in all our communities. We keep them close to our hearts as we gather here today. My name is Keith Marshall. I am the president of the First Nations Health Direct Association. I serve as one of the three regional board representatives from Vancouver Coastal Region. I also work as the director of community health programs at the Halikas Health Center Society in Bella Bella, and I come to you from the traditional territory of the Hays of people. I am honored to join this gathering to receive the updates in the critical, on the critical talk of cancer screening data reporting in First Nations communities. I extend my gratitude to each of you for being here today to take part in this discussion. The transformation of the healthcare system for First Nations people in BC is a collective and ongoing effort. I'm particularly thankful to our chiefs and leaders and to our health directors and government partners for their efforts and also express my appreciation to the FNHA, the FNHC, and for your continued support. And also thanks to Dr. Nell with the FNHA offer, Office of the Chief Medical Officer for leading this vital update. <clears throat> Cancer is a growing concern within First Nations communities and accurate culturally relevant data is essential to addressing this issue effectively. As we know, data is more than just numbers. It represents the lived experience and the story, and stories of First Nations individuals, families, and communities. For health directors and communities, this cancer screening will be helpful in a number of ways. Um, accurate data, cancer data helps First Nations identify disparities, disparities and focus where, are most, where it is most needed. By using this data to inform policy, we can then design and target interventions that are both effective and culturally safe. Understanding cancer trends and their link to the broader social determinants allows First Nations to develop long-term strategies that support the holistic health of First Nations people, this includes making sure that community members receive reliable health information, have opportunities to ask questions, and have their belief, priorities, and decisions respected by their health providers. This data empowers First Nations to advocate for the resources necessary to address the effects of cancer. They can highlight the urgency of cancer prevention, screening, and treatment services within First Nations communities, and this in turn will save lives. Using cancer data to drive health system changes also ensures that our services are inclusive and respectable for First Nations cultural context. This data supports the collective work of First Nations and health governance partners to advance building a healthy system that goes beyond socially focused on treatment to support self-determination and long-term well-being. It is important, important that we continue to, to uphold the principles of OCAP, ownership, control, access, and possession, to protect the integrity and respectful use of the health data. As health directors, we look forward to hearing the updates and asking questions about our cancer screening services. Thank you very much for having the time to speak with you today. And Nell, I return it back to you. 
Thank you to Keith and thanks also to Wade and Sheila both for being here with us today and also for your leadership. We will turn now to the actual presentation on First Nations Cancer Screening Update. And for that, uh, we'll start off with Dr. Nadine Caron. And please note this presentation will go on for approximately 40, 45 minutes and will be followed by a question and answer period. So Nadine, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chimigwich. Ani, I want to start off by expressing my gratitude first to the chiefs, leaders and health directors, not only for being here today, but also for all of the work you do for your communities. I want to uh, thank Sequalia for once again, starting us off in a good way. I always find it so peaceful to start off with her voice in my head. To now uh, Wyman and to the OCMO office, Sheila Blackstock, Wade Grant, Keith Marshall, I am honored actually to, to be in your presence and to hear your words and to recognize that this uh, presentation and the information that it is uh, it entails is, is important. It is desired, it has been requested, and I uh, gratefully uh, thank you for the honor of being part of the huge team has, that has really gone into pulling this all together. So I want to note what you've already sort of heard is that this information is going to be potentially sensitive. It may be difficult to process and it will most likely elicit some strong emotions. Uh, it is not lost on us that these are, while we, it is presented in numbers and bar graphs and line charts, these represent individuals, loved ones, family members. Um, and I think that uh, it's important to keep that first and foremost in our mind. Uh, I want to recognize that uh, if you have any questions about the data, first of all, it is being recorded. Uh, there are uh, infographics that will be made uh, available at a later date in, in preparation for the regional caucus meetings. And of course, the OCMO office is always there uh, as a resource for this data. There are, in addition, additional resources uh, for those um, that are potentially triggered by this. Um, recognizing that there's also additional ones in your communities, in your families, in your friendships. Uh, I think it's just really important to know that we are there for each other. On behalf of the team members were of the project team that were, went into this data, I want to acknowledge that we are grateful to be doing this work with and for First Nations on their traditional territories across the province. I myself, uh, my name is Nadine Caron, Nanawawankwe, uh, is my traditional turn name. Uh, I'm from the Sagamok Anishinaabek First Nation on my mother's side. Uh, and I think that's particularly, um, it, it's, it's so important to me uh, on the week of, of September 30th, starting off uh, and then recognizing that, thinking of my mom these days as she's at the Harvest Festival uh, on our traditional lands. And I know that she will be uh, uh, interested in this data Although Sagamok Anishinaabek First Nation is Anishinaabek and we're back in Ontario, um, I think it's important that we share this data um, with other First Nations so they can learn from the strength uh, of our communities here in BC. Uh, I'm joining you today from the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Klet Tene peoples. And I'm grateful to be on this traditional territory um, today and every day. So first of all, this has been a collaborative uh, effort and I'm gonna just sort of, a collaborative effort to improve quality care in the area of cancer. And it's been more than 10 years of working to improve First Nations cancer journeys in British Columbia. And this work has been guided by strong community feedback and engagement process over these years. There has been, an, it's an introduction to the commitment from four specific organizations in the province to improve First Nations and Indigenous cancer journeys in BC. Not only the First Nations Health Authority, but BC Cancer, the Métis Nation of BC, and the BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centres. It started off years ago by hosting two large gatherings focused on cancer called Telling Our Stories, one of them was based in Prince, uh, Prince George and one was based in Richmond, but there were other listening sessions with gathering wisdom, at which point even some of the early data was shared and elders gathering. It was also gathered by individual stories, stories told between patients and physicians, stories told uh, 
in the in those valid and really important sessions at coffee breaks at meetings, whether they're regional caucus meetings, caucus meetings or otherwise. This is highlighted by the work that is guided strongly by First Nations and Indigenous engagement, including First Nations patients, survivors, their families, representing the communities that we serve. So this led ultimately to the Indigenous cancer strategy that is guiding the work and there are two specific actions that we wanna to outline today. First of all, is simply that one of the roles or the goals of the First Nations Cancer Strategy or the Indigenous Cancer Strategy, I should say, is the establishment of the First Nations Health Authority Chair in Cancer and Wellness. I think UBC is unbelievably fortunate to be the place where this was established. And I cannot express my gratitude enough to, being the, to having the honor of being the inaugural FNHA Chair in Cancer and Wellness. But a big part of this strategy really was to develop data strategies on Indigenous cancer journeys in BC, including ongoing relevant data linkages with the First Nations client file. Of course, the First Nations client file helps to identify First Nations people in BC, either with status or who are eligible for status in the province of British Columbia. I think it's important to recognize and pause to remember that the data that we are about to share does not include those First Nations individuals that do not have status, nor Métis or Inuit individuals who live in the province of British Columbia. There, the findings are broken down, therefore, in the data that we have done as those who identify as First Nations and are in the client file and all other British Columbians. Uh, recognizing the limitations, once again, that we will not forget and will continue to strive to ensure that those voices are heard. So starting with cancer screening, I think it's important to first of all note that cancer screening means that we wanna to try to detect cancer in these programs before the individual having that particular screening test has any symptoms, meaning you feel great, you have no concerns, you don't have any problems with respect to that area, uh, of the body that is being screened for cancer, yet you go to see if there's any cancer that is so small, so tiny, so early along its stage that you're not having any symptoms. In addition, it also uh, is important to note that sometimes potential cancer can be identified and actually we can prevent cancer from even occurring if it's developed early enough with atypical cells, cells that aren't behaving themselves, cells that can be removed before they actually turn into cancer. So cancer screening detects it earlier and it can also in many cases prevent colon cancer, cervical cancer, or other cancers from being uh, developed in the human body. Right now, British Columbia through the BC cancer uh, has four cancer screening programs, breast cancer, cervical cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer. Lung cancer is by far the newest cancer screening program and we do not yet have data for that. Not that it's not important, we're just here to share the first three for which the programs have been in place for many years. This work is aimed to evaluate the effectiveness of colon cancer screenings in First Nations people within the client file in the province of British Columbia. So first let's start with colon cancer, or sorry, breast cancer screening. So breast cancer screening really is referring to a screening mammography. In BC, breast cancer screening is recommended for women every two years that are between the ages of 50 and 74. For women that are the ages of 40 to 49 or 75 and older, it is recommended that they talk to their primary care provider to see if screening, breast cancer screening is right for them. The Canadian breast cancer screening participation target is 70%. And I want you to see that in, if you look over at this graph, Essentially, when you look at the screening target at 70%, the, whether you're looking at all of BC, which is the dark purple, or First Nations, which is kind of the orange, that neither group is actually meeting the screening target. But more important, and for the people gathered here today, you can see that there is a persistent and very real gap between participation rates in breast cancer screening for First Nations, who are the lower uh, line on the graph, compared to all other women in BC. This is a stark disparity and it has persisted. We're showing the most recent nine years of data and it hasn't changed. Specifically, an example between 2017 and 2019, which is the most recent time period where we have specific data, 
Almost a third of First Nations people between the ages of 50 and 69 screened at 31%, but we have to compare it to almost 50% of the rest of British Columbian women participated in breast cancer screening. So the first message here we're getting is that First Nations women who are eligible for screening are not getting the screening that's strongly recommended and has been proven to save lives. We have, don't have the answers here in terms of why not. And that's some of the answers that, and some of the uh, suggestions that we're gonna put forward with uh, Warren and Nell. We're gonna look uh, next at cervical cancer screening. Cervical cancer screening in British Columbia up until very recently, earlier this year, required pap tests or, uh, that were recommended every three years for women between the ages of 25 and 69. The target for cervical cancer screening in Canada is 80%. And once again, if you look at the screening target rate in the first top left bar graph here, see if I can point, neither the all, the, all of BC or, and the First Nations women meet the target that we're looking for. But I wanna point out again that when we look at all people being in that screening target age group, 25 to 69, once again, the First Nations line is lower than the rest of British Columbia. Now we break it down by age, and interestingly enough, for 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, not only is that gap persistent, but it actually is getting in larger with age. But look at the 20 to 25 to 29 year. You can see there that that is one age group where actually First Nations women between the ages of 25 and 29 have a higher cervical cancer screening rate. And I think this is something to look into, something to understand, something to celebrate, and something that we need to replicate as we move forward and ensure that all First Nations women start to increase their screening uh, for, colon, uh, for cervical cancer. And then the final one that we're gonna look at today in a little bit more detail is colon cancer screening. So essentially colon cancer screening if you take a look at this, I wanna start off with incidence. Incidence of colon cancer means the number of new diagnoses of cancer in a year. So an incidence rate for one year means the number of new diagnoses of that cancer. And in this case, looking at colon cancer incidence. This graph shows between 1995 and 2015, 2000, actually 17. And it goes from, and if you can take a look once again, but this time we're looking at incidence. We don't wanna be on the top, like screening. We wanna be at the bottom. We wanna have the lowest incidence, the lowest number of colon cancers diagnosed each year. But unfortunately, that's not what we're seeing. What we're seeing here is if you look at the top graph, we're seeing that for First Nations people, and this is men and women, the rate of new colon cancer diagnoses year after year between 1993 and 2017, the rates of colon cancer are going up for First Nations. And the rates for all other British Columbians is actually trending down. And there is a significant, important, vital, non-negotiable, proven gap between the incidence rates of colon cancer for First Nations men and women among multiple, multiple years across all age groups. This is a major deal. And it's one of the reasons why we're really showing incidence for colon cancer in this particular cancer, partly because colon cancer screening can detect it at an earlier stage and it can also improve survival and we can prevent colon cancer in many scenarios if we, if we do that. In 2015 to 2017, which is some of the most recent data we have, the risk of new colon cancers was one and a half times higher for First Nations individuals, men and women, compared to the rest of British Columbia. And that is something that we do need to address. So one way to address it is with the colon cancer screening. So in British Columbia, the FIT colon cancer screening test is recommended every two years for most people between the ages of 50 and 74. The FIT testing, which Warren's gonna to explain to you in a lot more detail, is basically a stool test that you do to look for invisible blood so that if it's positive and it shows blood, the next step is a colonoscopy to see, is there a reason for that blood that is either pre-cancer, a polyp that could turn, up to, turn into cancer with years left to go unattended, 
or is there a tiny tumor that's not causing any symptoms, a cancer that can be removed early on. Individuals with a personal history of polyps, otherwise termed adenomas, or a family history of colon cancer really should ask their doctor about whether a colonoscopy is actually better for them than just a fit test. So colon cancer screening is a lot harder to understand because it's much more complex in terms of what's recommended based on family history, based on previous tests, and there's different types of screening that are indicated. The rate, the, the recommendation is 60% for all people based on the Canadian uh, suggestions. And I wanna show you here that this is participation uh, of colon cancer screening, looking at the FIT program, the stool sample test in British Columbia between 2017 and 2019. Once again, the purple is for uh, all other BC and the, the faded beige, yellow, or sorry, orange is participation of those in the client file, men and women. And this time we're looking at screening. We'd rather be the higher one, we're not. We are the lower ones across the board. First Nations have a lower rate of screening, men and women in all age groups across the board in this time period, and it mirrors similar time periods. We also wanted to say, okay, once you've had screening, is it does it improve? Are you up to date on your screening? This is a little bit harder to kind of explain, but generally speaking, you can see here, uh, there. Uh, Overall, sorry about that. The screening participation rate is 60%. That's the target goal. And you can see that very rarely, except for on the far right in the 70 to 74 year age group, do First Nations individuals even meet that goal in being up to date. Being up to date means that as, as a human being with a colon, you're at risk for colon cancer. So a one-time screening is not good enough. We wanna make sure that we take care of our bodies every year. Now, what we're recommending is with respect to screening, a FIT test, we wanna see it, is it done every two years? And we kind of say, okay, two and a half years. A screening colonoscopy every 10 years, okay, 10 and a half years. And even with that little bit of wiggle room, we see that First Nations individuals are lower in being up to date in their screening. And we have shown that screening detects cancer at an earlier stage. We've shown that it increases survival rates if you detect it at an earlier stage. And it's so important to get these screening rates different. But the question is, why are they different? How do we improve it? And what are we gonna do about it? And now I'm gonna pass this over to Dr. Wyman because I think the First Nations Health Authority has some great ideas on how to improve cancer care in partnership with BC Cancer. Dr. Wyman. Thanks, Dr. Karen. Uh, so some of the things that we've been thinking about, about how to improve First Nations cancer outcomes, including screening, have to do with these three things that you see on the screen here. Uh, Dr. Caron's research confirms that cancer screening programs have not been meeting the needs of First Nations people in BC. And to improve cancer outcomes, the healthcare system needs to improve access to screening services, cultural safety in the healthcare system, and access to reliable information. So access, for example, as I've often said uh, in various town halls, is not just having say, for example, immediate access to a primary care provider, a bricks and mortar building to go to. Uh, you may receive the kit in the mail in order to uh, do your screening, but access also has to do with whether First Nations people feel comfortable accessing and utilizing those services. So how can we increase people's comfort in accessing, in this case, cancer screening programs? The other thing that we're well aware of is that racism is, uh, uh, you know, alive and well, unfortunately, in our healthcare system, and we have various initiatives on improving cultural safety, and then also helping people understand with reliable information, uh, similar to what Dr. Karen was just uh, sharing with you about the different kinds of cancers, what you can do in terms of prevention, what you can do in terms of screening and what a cancer journey may look like. And we have various resources uh, available, uh, for example, on our FNHA website. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we also heard uh, during the Sacred and Strong report about people's, uh, people's opinions and thoughts around how uh, cancer outcomes are impacted by access to culturally safe, timely, appro and timely access and appropriate care. And as these quotes from the FNHA's Sacred and Strong report show, access is affected by past experiences with health services. So for example, people may have been treated very, in a very unfriendly, you know, dismissive way. They may have experienced racism. Uh, the availability of trusted health providers. So people may not have a primary care provider. They may not know where to go in terms of accessing screening. Uh, and physical distance. So we know, for example, that geography and being physically distant from some of these services uh, impacts, people's impact, impacts people's ability to access these services. One of the things um, that I noticed last week, I was actually up in Clay Clay Tene territory attending a women's gathering on the toxic drug crisis and the VP of regional operations, Julie Morrison, excused herself on day one for a short period of time uh, to go get a mammography at the hospital. And, and she told me that there had been some slots cleared uh, for women attendees because women came from all over uh, the northern region to attend this gathering. So having, you know, special events and having mammography, for example, available uh, at these events it can be really helpful in terms of getting people up to date on their screenings. We also know that um, I've already mentioned systemic racism having an impact on people's ability to access the healthcare system and as well experiences of past sexual trauma and or intimate partner violence. So, you know, getting these screenings for breast, cervical and colon cancer can be uh, in some cases, very triggering and really challenging for people to follow through with and impact people's willingness to be able to screen uh, for these three cancers that are currently available, as well as the lung cancer screening that Nadine mentioned, which is a little bit more complicated. Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A period. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, um, how we can improve First Nations cancer outcomes. Another step toward improving access to services is through our First Nations Virtual Doctor of the Day program, which is a unique service providing culturally safe care and is open to all First Nations people and their families living in BC. So if you are eligible to go have cancer screening of any of those types, you do need a primary care provider to receive the screening results. The virtual doctor of the day can help with the screening process if you don't have a primary care provider. Um, and information about how to access the doctor of the day program is available on our First Nations, uh, First Nations Health Authority website under virtual health. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Warren. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Wyman. So just briefly, I'm uh, Selksa. Good afternoon. My name is Warren Claremont. I'm the Executive Director of Indigenous Health and Cultural Safety here at BC Cancer. Proud member of Gitmax of the Gitsan First Nation. So shout out to my relatives back home. I've been living and working in the traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples here, also known as Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations for the past 20 some odd years since I completed university. And I continue to be grateful to them for allowing me to live, work, and play and raise my family here. I'm also a cancer survivor, diagnosed in 2009, spent the better part of that year receiving treatment here in BC Cancer Victoria. And so bring some of that personal experience to this role and leading the implementation of the Indigenous Cancer Strategy. So with that out of the way, I'm going to talk about what we're doing, particularly in screening. We saw some concerning data with screening, but thankfully there are some things that we can do in terms of bringing screening access closer to home and removing barriers. And so, as uh, Dr. Karan alluded to earlier, we have a new self-screening test for cervix screening. It's uh, called HPV self-collection. And so we have been rolling out this self-collection test across the province for the past better part of a year, working with a number of First Nations communities, particularly those that have health clinics. 
So is the self swab test where eligible individuals due for cervical screening can get a self test from their local nursing station, health center, primary care provider, or you can even get it online via a form now. Participants can then complete the test wherever they're most comfortable. It can be at home, could be at the nursing station, a clinic, um, and then it can be mailed back. Uh, and so again, we've been working with a number of communities to improve access to these tests. And again, bring screening closer to home. We've seen generally amongst the rest of the British Columbia population that this test has been able to drive cervical cancer incidents down. And we saw some good news, particularly amongst the younger population of 25 to 29, more investigative work needs to be done to engage that younger population of First Nations females to understand why we see higher screening participation. Right. I think we intuitively know perhaps why that may be, but more engagement needs to happen. Secondly, you see our uh, mobile mammography van there in the top right hand corner. Many of you will be familiar with this. We've had the mobile mammography program running for a number of years. We've been going to about 40 First Nations communities per year. So more work needs to be done. Uh, we have three of these vans. They go across the province, uh, generally when the weather is good. Um, and what's important here to know is that First Nations women are accessing these mobile vans at a three to one ratio compared to all, all other women in BC. So one in three First Nations mammograms are done via the mobile units compared to about one in 13 mammograms for all other British Columbia women. So we know that by bringing this service closer to the community, we're gonna see higher utilization and therefore higher participation and hopefully retention. So. Having the van go to more First Nations communities, working with you to understand what the barriers are, facilitating uh, culturally safe access to breast screening is the work that our team has been focused on. And we're going to continue to hopefully work with you to bring uh, breast screening closer to home and also just more information generally. And the third test I want to talk about, which Dr. Karan also spoke about, was the FIT test, the fecal immunochemical test, also known as what we call poop on a stick. Uh, it is the alternative to the colonoscopy. This is also something that is a uh, self-test that can be done in the comfort of your own home. Your healthcare provider will give you a requisition, a fit requisition form to, uh, to bring to a lab. You then bring the kit home, collect your poop, your sample, and then you return it to the lab. And much like cervical cancer incidents, we have seen amongst all other British Columbians that since we've introduced the colon screening program, We've, we've seen colon cancer incidents go down. And so we feel if we're able to bring this test to more communities, create culturally safe access to this new test, a relatively new test, uh, we can also decrease incidence. So that's the third uh, test that we're hoping to bring closer to First Nations communities. And I think we've seen positive results uh, with the rest of the population. Next slide, please. So what else have we done? Well, one of the first things we heard when we developed the Indigenous Cancer Strategy, all of the patients that we've been working with since and that, have we, and that we've engaged have said, we need more Indigenous people working at the cancer centers, you know, starting with patient navigators. We also know them as uh, hospital liaisons. They're called a number of different things. We've called them BC Cancer Indigenous Patient Navigators. We now have eight of these roles. You'll see six of our folks here working across these six regional cancer centers established in 2021. And so they will support navigation, advocacy, help you uh, access referrals and different, to different services in the community. We also have a Indigenous Patient Support Fund where we will help support costs re related to travel, accommodations, any other costs that are not covered through First Nations Health Benefits. We're basically there to act and be a family member. That's that's the messaging. And so we hope to add more of these roles over the next number of years through the cancer plan. As we see, you know, higher utilization, we have two of these roles each now at Vancouver and Kelowna. And we're looking at other roles like Indigenous counselors, for instance. It's not just patient navigators that we need at these centers. So uh, responding to the, the needs of community members and patients, we now have these roles and these re resources at all the cancer centers. Next slide, please. So uh, we were BC Cancer partnered with FNHA through the generous support of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer to uh, access resources to develop the First Nations screening campaign. And you'll see here three amazing uh, health leaders and then me 
And uh, we participated in the campaign essentially to promote screening amongst First Nations communities, right? Purpose was to increase knowledge about all three programs, well, four now that we have lung screening, and just bringing awareness to existing services, right? And how important screening is. And that all what we're trying to do is essentially give community members the information to make informed decisions about their own health. But as Dr. Karan spoke earlier, you know, screening is prevention. And we know that, that we can drive down incidents through screening. And so I think that by leveraging our community health leaders, continuing to go out to communities directly, share information, hear feedback, I think that's the way uh, to increase participation and access to screening. Next slide, please. Okay, so how can we improve outcomes? Screening is the biggest way, right? But cultural safety plays a big role as well, right? We need to have people. It's not just faces, but it's also spaces, right? Culturally safe facilities is a big part of it. We're doing lots of work in that space. But ultimately, it's going to be about bringing services closer to home and then also looking internally at training. Cultural safety training is now mandatory for all of our providers and staff at BC Cancer. Now that we have data, we can now set targets, right? The system, the cancer system is setting targets for all of the British Columbians because they have data, right? And I think this presents an opportunity for us collectively to hold the system accountable, right? To working with First Nations communities to improve outcomes, to improve access. Our team of Indigenous Cancer Control is here. We've been out to a number of communities. I was talking with Snanemo the other day about cancer screening. And so we will always be here as a facilitator, a coordinator, and a resource, um, acting as someone on the inside, trying to change the system, changing guidelines, changing policies. So the data presents, as, as Dr. Karan and Dr. Wyman said, it's, it's just so powerful. It allows us to do many things, and it allows us to hold the system accountable. You'll see on this slide here, we've identified four different resources where you can access information. You can always contact me directly as well or any one of our team team members and we'd be happy to work with you. Um, and the way forward is to use this data to inform a second iteration of the Indigenous Cancer Strategy. You recall, recall the first surveillance study that we did informed the first Indigenous Cancer Strategy. Now we have distinctions-based data. And I think that it makes sense for us to use that to inform First Nations specific priorities in collaboration and in partnership with FNHA. And so, uh, next slide, please. I think that is Amia. Um, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you to Warren and Dr. Caron for sharing all of that information. Uh, we can now, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's perfectly fine. We will turn to the question and answer period. And while I'll just make a reminder for people, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, we will get to you in sequence, uh, and you can also type a question into the Q&A box as you uh, have already, so two people have already done, and then we'll start going through the questions. So there was one that came up um, uh, a little while ago from uh, Arlene uh, that says, for that age bracket, do you think it's due to birth control? Curious. And I think uh, Arlene, maybe if you uh, want to ask your question out loud, uh, you can go ahead. But I think you're referring to the higher rates of cervical screening, cancer screening for uh, First Nations young women in the 20 to 29 age bracket. But just want to clarify. Oh, OK. So Arlene didn't want to be <laughs> promoted. That's fine. Uh, I think uh, from what I read from that question is uh, wanting to know if we had any thoughts around why younger uh, First Nations women seem to have higher screening rates for cervical cancer. So Nadine, maybe? Sure, so um, great question. I think it's a success story. So we have to start to figure out like, where's that success? Um, we're, we're where we want, we, we're at the, uh, we're on the top line on a graph where we wanna be the top line. Um, a couple things. One is we're still below the target, so we need to still strive for that improvement. But I think it, it, there may be a few reasons for it. And uh, I, it's not my area as a surgical oncologist. I'm not a primary care provider. But one thing I can say is 
this, I, when I saw that data, one of the things I thought of is this is an age group that went through getting immunized for HPV in high school. Uh, and, and they went through wondering like, why am I getting immunized for this? And, and the answer was, well, it's this virus that increases your risk for this thing called cervical cancer. And so it's, they, they're not told about, um, colon cancer or, or other cancers at that young age. Um, but they're not also at risk for it, but it's, it's more of a dialogue that I think is being brought into the healthcare system and their healthcare. And I think similarly as well, I think you also hit it on um, with respect to oral contraceptives or other types of contraceptives um, where primary care providers are being more open, transparent and honest and respectful with uh, our indigenous, um, uh, I wanna call them youth, but it really gives away my age, it really does. But for the most part, I think really training healthcare providers to make sure that they do that type of screening and make sure that that's up to date and give uh, those individuals a choice for that and recommend them for that, but also take the time and explain why is that important? Because I think sometimes respectful healthcare includes not only what Warren was referring to with respect to the cultural safety, but also recognizing that that is a, a pap smears, especially because this data is all before the self-collection. You need to trust that healthcare provider. And in order to build trust, you need to know why are they explaining it? What does it entail? Why does it entail that? And rec and realize like Dr. Wyman said in the very beginning, it's, it's not a surprise that the screening rates are lower when colon cancer screening often requires a colonoscopy. Mammogram, mammograms are a, um, basically an X-ray of your breasts, you know, and then cervical pap smears are an inter, a, a, a very intimate, very um, um, potentially triggering experience for women that go through that. You need to recognize it. You need to respect that. You need to be in that space and really provide the reasons about what, why, when, how, all of that, and give women the choice to make the decision. And I think our next generation, those 25, 29 year olds have started to see an insight into that because of the prevention upstream, which was the vaccine. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Dr. Karam, for that answer and Arlene for the question. The next question is from Shailene Harry, who's a health director. Is there any plans to increase the number of mammavans? We tried for a year to get the mammavan into our community and just finally secured a date in April 2025. We were told they were only able to add one or two new communities each year. This in itself is a barrier, especially when the data shows that mammavans are more successful than getting our members into the hospital for a mammogram. So maybe to take a first uh, try at this, uh, I'll ask Warren for some thoughts. Thank you for that question. And I wholeheartedly agree. I think we've looked, you know, as I've been in the last six years at BC Cancer, I've seen numerous barriers of our own making, right? For instance, the mobile mammography, the guidelines for the vans to go out, they define reasonable access as within one hour's drive to the nearest screening clinic. So if you're 50 minutes outside of the nearest screening clinic, you're not eligible for the vans to go there. And we've seen that from a number of communities who have reached out, tried to get the van to go and were rebuffed. Since that time, <clears throat> and since I presented this new data, we've now switched gears. We're going to tear open those guidelines, rewrite them. And from a perspective of equity, like it was, I couldn't believe that they had defined access that way. And so there's a number of things I'm trying to undo internally that will free up capacity for those vans to go to more communities. And I love that. So I've suggested actually adding a new van as well, right? Adding a fourth van that perhaps would just go to First Nations communities. I think that's the type of innovative thinking that we need. And so I've been working with the BC Cancer Foundation as an idea to perhaps purchase a new van. Wouldn't it be great if we had Indigenous or First Nations mammotechs on those vans as well? Like, I think that's the vision that we have is, is training our own community members to work in those spaces. And so I totally agree. I'm working hard on the inside here, trying to revisit all of those barriers and remove them 
as well as engaging community members to find out how we can improve access to these vans. And so I'll, I'll admit that we have challenges with staffing with the vans. We're also purchasing new ones in the, uh, currently. So we do hope that we'll get back up to full capacity and that we'll be able to offer way more opportunities to go to communities and not as far out as April 2025. So more information to come, but I hear you loud and clear and I totally agree. Great, and thank you to Jennifer Davidson who's been putting in some comments. Uh, she did mention the staffing uh, challenges with the MAMA vans. Uh, so we'll turn to the next question, which is from uh, Janice Angus, uh, who is uh, from NISCA. And she wrote, uh, during the presentation, uh, you mentioned options of doctor of the day. Is there data to show how many have accessed this service? Additionally, the mobile clinics access to mail-in services such as the FIT test. So this is, I think, kind of a broad question that's asking about the different availabilities of how to access the screening. I think we have someone uh, looking into some of the information around uh, the virtual doctor of the day. However, I'll just say that, uh, you know, we have at FNHA, we have two virtual services. One is the doctor of the day, which provides primary care or general health care. And the other one is our virtual psychiatry and substance use service. Both of them, I think, have been very um, successful in terms of drawing large numbers of patients. Uh, they are known for uh, providing culturally safe care. Uh, and in some ways uh, have been victims of their own success in the sense that the waiting lists, uh, the waiting lists uh, to be seen, uh, even though we try to keep them as low as possible, has sometimes gotten a little bit high, especially for the psychiatry and substance use service. So um, they have been very successful in terms of people reaching out to them. So I don't know... Um, whether or not we should break it down. Uh, but there's a couple of things happening on the screen here. Um, does anybody, Warren or, Nate or Dr. Caron, do you want to uh, talk about uh, if there's any data around usage of the mobile clinics or access to mail-in services as yet? Yeah, I can speak to the, the mobile uh, mammography bands if that's what the question was. And as I mentioned earlier, we know that one in three First Nations mammograms are done via the bands. And so we know that the fixed site screening clinics, which I'll give you for the seven here on Vancouver Island, they're underutilized, right? And probably for good reason. I think we, we've heard some of that already in terms of just the safety and not wanting to go into a hospital. A lot of these places feel very institutional. And then you can get screened at home with the mobile vans, with your peers, with your community members. So it's it's almost a no-brainer. So we do have some data to show where women were screened in terms of mammograms. And as I mentioned, it's, it's you know, one in three First Nations mammograms done via the mobile vans, 33% basically. And so there's opportunity there. We also need to try to better understand what are the barriers to accessing the fixed site clinics? We know geography is part of it. We know safety is a part of it. Uh, but what we want to also do is bring folks together and try to understand what, what your attitudes and feelings are about those fixed site clinics. I think we need to do everything, right? The mobile vans is where we should focus our energy for sure, because we can make an immediate dent in that participation rate gap just by having the vans go to more communities. But we also need to understand why the fixed site clinics are underutilized. And so there's some community engagement that needs to happen there. And some of that conversation is already happening. So we do have some information, but not around the cervix self-screening uh, test just yet. Dr. Caron, I think uh, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, a great question. And I certainly, as usual, pretty much as always, agree with Warren. Um, you know, uh, uh, many years ago, uh, we looked into this when fixed mammography was uh, really expected to be the route, but there was mobile uh, mammography units. And we did something in Prince George here on Clayton territory. And we did, we thought, why don't we ask for a fixed mobile mammography unit to come to the Friendship Centre in a space, like Warren said, that would be more culturally 
uh, safe and something uh, and a place that would uh, really resonate more with um, an Indigenous individual that wanted to get a screening mammogram. Uh, so apart from some major mistakes, like we didn't realize that the mammogram would fit into the Friendship Centre doorway and we had to take the doorway off to get it in, what we realized is that there were there was a lot of resistance at first from BC Cancer and there's a lot of things about these mobile units, like they had to be pre-booked at least a certain percentage before they felt like it was worthwhile. I don't know how much you put a life, how much you value a life, but we've demonstrated the importance of screening mammography in terms of early stage of diagnosis and life-saving uh, treatments that are gonna be available and survival rates. What I didn't go into is in the data that we've showed is that First Nations women who have lower screening rates present with breast cancer when it's diagnosed at a later stage and they have lower survival rates if they are on the cancer care journey with breast cancer. So we know that this is an issue across the board. And so one of the things we had to do was we had to say, okay, but you can't expect there to be, it had the, the unit, they can't be appointments of only eight minutes. You gotta give them time because some of these women have never had a screening mammogram and you can't rush it. That's the information, the understanding, the, the why and the how. Um, the next thing was, is that you had to recognize that individuals, we, we need to bring people in and see if they were interested based on the information they were getting. We couldn't rebook or pre-book. The FNHA has really, really addressed uh, the with the doctor of the day, that barrier of not having a primary care provider, which we did in this rotation uh, or in this project. But the other thing is, is we heard loud and clear that the fixed mammography units, meaning the mammogram machines that were bolted into the cement of institutions like a hospital that bring potentially horrific memories to the actual individual, if not their families or things they've heard about, which our ancestors have endured, in these kind of institutions that all of a sudden they had to go through these doors for something when they were feeling fine and then have a horrific experience or a stressful experience or an anxiety producing experience where they felt fine and they go in and they leave with confusion, anxiety, feeling disrespected, you know, and those are some of the outcomes. And so how do we address that? Well, we recognize that, you know what, sometimes the fixed units are not the best. Sometimes options are better. And I think every human being feels better if they have options, choices, and they're respected in that way. And I love the idea of having a specific First Nations mammogram unit that really goes to these communities. And we have mammogram texts that can speak in um, in a culturally safe way be, and because they sort of feel it right to their core. Uh, I think it's great to have mammogram texts that are culture, you know, that undergo that cultural training, which is super important. Um, I love your ideas, Warren, if there's anything that the FNHA chair can help. But I mean, you've got the OCMO office and you have these amazing people that are on the, in the audience today that I think are hearing you. And um, it resonates with me uh, as a First Nations female who needs screening mammograms. Thank you, Dr. Karen. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A, but Jessica Frank, who's a health director in Little Watt, has her hand raised. Uh, so we'll ask her, we'll turn to her and ask her to ask her a question. Jessica? Thank you, Dr. Anel. Um, I'm not sure if I joined in the right spot, but I just clicked around and I figured it out. Uh, thank you for your your amazing presentation. And um, when it comes to cancer and First Nations throughout the province, um, you know, we're starting to see it more and more within our communities. And, you know, I just sent to uh, email that I sent out to BC Cancer starting last August, and we finally got notification that BC Cancer is coming for a mammo, mammogram clinic for, for our nation. 
But the, the time and the capacity that had to come from me as a health director for Leowat Nation to be able to advocate on behalf of our communities. And, you know, I'm so glad to hear that some of our First Nations communities are finally getting visitations and ours is in November. And I heard some late as April and, you know, we we knew this data already before this presentation that our cancer is pretty below the screening um, needs, especially when it comes to First Nations communities. And, you know, I want you to note and share the email that I did send out and regarding, you know, the visit to Leowat Nation. They were visiting the non-First Nations in our community and not even notifying us. Usually we piggyback on the same visit for the BC cancer bus that comes. And another piece that, you know, I wanted to note that I noted in that email as well is that, um, you know, our medical transportation piece, and I'm sure health directors uh, wanted to, me to kind of represent as well to advocate for our communities that, you know, if we don't have this culturally safe visit from these uh, buses into communities, then we can't provide medical transportation to outside external screening clinics when it comes to um, screening for cancer. And that when we have a closest provider coming into community, we aren't able to give out medical transportation, even when our doctors refer our community members to go for a mammogram in in the city, for example, Vancouver. And, you know, we've had so many back and forths there that our community members were having to pay for their own because it's been like two or three years since we've had a visit from our mobile clinic. And so, you know, I just wanted to kind of note that piece. And, you know, I, I think we're slowly improving on the medical transportation piece, but, you know, having our community members already struggle and ensuring, you know, their health and safety when it comes to cancer and early detection, like you mentioned that, you know, it, something needs to be done better and, you know, not saying, oh, no, we can't provide you for medical transportation to Vancouver because we had a mobile clinic three years ago or two years ago when we're telling people to get screened every two to five years or three to five years. And so, you know, we got to be careful on those pieces and then people forget about it and like, I can't deal with this anymore. And so, you know, those are some of the barriers that our community members have to stress about when, you know, they're, it comes to their own health, especially cancer. And, you know, we've had a few cancer patients in community that are huge advocates and also assist new people that have diagnosis of cancer when it came come to other um, cancers. But, you know, there are advocates to share and saying, you know, get screened early. And, you know, I, I think there are champions right now, but, you know, for the ones that get left behind because little things, having to be declined for patient travel, but still try to make it to the city and so I just wanted to note those two pieces. And um, also, thank you for the information about the other um, cervical cancer and the other, can't remember off the top of my head, but having that information, I can start to share that with community as well. So thank you for listening and thank you for my for your time for allowing me to speak. Bookshunka. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, maybe what we'll do is I'll turn first to Dr. Caron uh, and Warren, whether they have any comments, and then possibly we might have a response as well from uh, somebody from Health Benefits, uh, the Medical Transportation Program. First of all, uh, Jessica, thanks so much for your, your courage. Um, in sharing that story and, and and for the work behind the scenes, uh, the advocacy uh, that you've done, um, the emails, the phone calls, the sitting with patients and the families and hearing their stories and honoring them. 
Um, I, I think one thing that we haven't brought up are those community champions. Um, though they're so, their voices, their passion, their lived experience is so huge. It cannot be measured. Um, but what a burden uh, on them. Uh, and so how do we support them? You're, you're mentioning things that I certainly hear about and I, I struggle with in my own world as a, what I, as a cancer surgeon in terms of working with that travel. And it gets even more complicated because what we've described to you through the data and the process that we've done as a team um, is looking at cancer screening for someone at sort of average risk based on like the data that we see overall as Canadians. We haven't looked specifically at what should the guidelines be for these screening tools for First Nations based on the data, like the incidence and survival. And so one thing is, is how do we adjust for, for that in terms of screening? And then how do we lobby for individuals who are at higher risk that need even more frequent um, screening and more frequent investigations? And how do we package that into something that if it is recommended that that community travel is made available and or the resources are brought to the community and have finding a combination of that. There's so many questions, but I think we're noticing something very similar in terms of what the OCMO office is saying, what uh, Warren is saying, what the data is showing, what the community stories are sharing, what you and your role is sharing is that it's, it's not the individuals. It's it's not there. There's a lot of rationale and reasons and barriers and challenges um, that are are there. That um, I think we're a group of people that are looking at what's wrong that is blocking and putting up barriers. And it's it's so important to recognize that that we're in a space where sometimes in the healthcare system, when I'm walking down the hallways of a hospital. Um, the point, the finger is pointed uh, at the individuals. Why didn't they do this? They should have known this. And it's just, it's so important that we keep that vision, recognizing that we need to figure out all the reasons why, uh, and it's individuals wanting to do what's, what um, is healthy, what is wellness, so that they can be there for their children, they can be there for their community. And I think it's it's so such a big highlight. And you brought in a whole other area of community champions, their role and how to support them and patients and how we support them with uh, that travel when we can't get the mobile units. And then Warren's working on the mobile units. And I think the best thing about all of this is we're starting to be able to take those community stories and match it with the data saying the communities were right all along. The leaders were right all along. But you can't hide from it now because here's the data that actually came from your own sources uh, and you can't hide from it. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks, Dr. Carolyn, for that answer. Um, I think just to round out this question, we'll turn to Tanya Duncan, who we're lucky to have with us. Uh, as a panelist, uh, she is from our health benefits program uh, and can speak to some of the medical transportation issues. Uh, Tanya, over to you. Afternoon. Uh, um, Tanya Duncan, I'm the executive director in health benefits. Um, so just uh, to speak to Jessica's question in regards to probably the closest appropriate provider, uh, question. We realize that some challenges around that, and we do accept some exceptions in regards to the closest appropriate provider um, if there's no service or there's um, some culturally safe um, access issues regarding that. So um, if you do have your own PT clerk, and I'm not sure if you do have your own patient travel clerk within Lilwatt, um, you can connect with our office as well or connect in with me in terms of any challenges regarding um, access or the closest appropriate provider uh, piece. But we do, obviously, if there is a closest provider that's available to you, then, then that would be sort of the, the choice um, uh, around uh, Lilwatt um, area. So um, um, 
but I'll, I'll put my email in the chat uh, as well if you want to connect. Um, if you if there's any specific um, examples that you have that were in the past, and we can connect on a regular basis because I have um, the health benefits operations team is uh, reporting into myself. Um, so we can connect in on that and have a discussion of examples where you've seen the closest provider not being um, or your me medical transportation not being approved because of the closest provider. Great. Thank you, Tanya, for that answer. Um, Warren, I just want to ask you quickly if you want to add anything. Uh, if not, we'll keep going with the Q&A. Yeah, just, just quickly here. Thank you for that, Jessica. And please do forward me your email, right? I'm trying to make our colleagues aware of all of the correspondence that's come from community, whether it's, you know, happy or unhappy, we need to make people aware. One of the things we talked about too around, you know, getting creative is maybe we have our mobile vans go to certain communities, but then we rent another van that goes out and picks up community members from surrounding communities and brings them to the mobile van. Right, kind of like a hub and spoke model, if you will. Because we have some communities that are, you know, maybe maybe are, are smaller, but still have a number of women who want to get screened and are eligible, but don't want to go to the hospital, right? Or the clinic that's close. So let's find a way to bring them to where the van is going to be, right? And so that's a role that we could play at BC Cancer. I think I've already talked to the BC Cancer Foundation around funding. We could easily develop a bit of a grant program or we could support communities to do that work, or we do it. Right? We rent a van, we'll support picking participants up from surrounding communities and bring them to the van. Right, So there's lots, I think, there's ways we're trying to get around the current challenges. Obviously, the best thing would be to have the van go to more communities and have more vans. I think that's the medium, well, hopefully the shorter term objective, but it could take a bit more time. So just getting creative, right? And I, I don't want cost to be the barrier. That's what I've been saying internally. Cost should not be the barrier, right? And so if there's one thing we can do, it's remove that. So be very interested in working with, with the community and, and supporting the van to go there, or again, getting creative to maybe pick up participants and bring them to the van uh, and do it that way. Thanks, Warren. And just to follow up before we go further uh, to answer some more uh, Janice Angus's question around the virtual doctor of the day, uh, Tanya Duncan has put um, some information into the chat but for those of you who may be on your phones and it may be a challenge, I'll just read out uh, some of the basic statistics around the usage of the virtual doctor of the day program. So uh, 25 physicians took 765 shifts in the first quarter of this fiscal year with the total encounter volume being 3,086 uh, patient contacts. This is a 4.9% increase as compared to Q1 of the last fiscal year. Average wait times across the province is approximately three weeks for non-urgent appointments and 2.6 days for urgent appointments. The phone system managed approximately 13,700 inbound and outbound calls, which is a 3.8% increase. So as we mentioned, this has been a service that has been well received and well used. Um, so I'm going to turn next back to the Q&A uh, portion. Uh, and there is a, a question from Jennifer Davidson. Who oversees the onboarding orientation for the Indigenous patient navigators? I feel better connection to patients is needed. If I understand they are hired by the health authority and answer to the health authority, would it not be better for communities to send navigators from community to the health authority site to help patients navigate and feel comfortable and understood? Just putting it out there, thanks. Uh, so I'll open it up if anybody feels they want to uh, comment uh, about indigenous patient navigators. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. So I think there's two parts to this, right? I mean, so BC Cancer, we're part of the Provincial Health Services Authority. So kind of like the sixth health authority, if you will, provincial services. And so we manage the six regional cancer centers. That'll be Victoria, Vancouver, Surrey, 
Abbotsford, Kelowna, and Prince George. And so if you go to those regional centers, which most patients will eventually go there at least once, you'll be able to access our Indigenous patient navigators who work on my team as part of Indigenous Cancer Control. They report to me, well, not me directly, but our team, and they're onboarded by us in collaboration with our partners. And But we also have these other satellite clinics that are run by the health authorities, the regional health authorities, and they're called community oncology network sites, basically just satellite clinics. They are managed by the regional health authorities. And you can also get systemic therapy treatment and other sorts of chemotherapy at those sites. I do not have any influence over those sites. And so I can't say, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is what type of Indigenous First Nation supports do they have at some of those satellite clinics? It's not clear to me right now. And so by working with the regional health authorities, I think we can hopefully figure out where those gaps are. And to your suggestion about bringing navigators that are from community into some of those sites, I mean, I would be all for it. I think that their you know, capacity will probably be an issue, but if there's a gap in service, we got to find a way to, to fill that gap. And so while I'm doing what I can in my sphere of influence, which is at BC Cancer at the regional centers, I am talking with our health authority partners to better understand what types of services are there for Indigenous patients and families at the health authority run sites. So, yeah, so that's kind of the, the nuance there and doing what I can in my sphere of influence, but also starting now to reach out to the health authorities and get a better understanding of you know, what exists currently and how can we work together to make sure First Nations and other Indigenous patients receive the same type of care, regardless of whether they come to a regional centre or a satellite clinic. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and just the question that was asked about navigators, I see there's some agreement uh, from Nadine Reginald from Yistway Health. Yes, I agree, each community needs their own navigators. So I'll turn now, there was a comment and a question. Uh, so I'm just scrolling up. Uh -oh. Now, while you're looking for that, may I make up one final comment about that, those sort of community supports and the patient navigators? Sure, take it away, because I'm looking. Yeah, and then while you're searching through there. So the other thing is, is that there's this whole other area of cancer that doesn't fall under BC cancer, because it, in order to really have a referral accepted at BC cancer, you need the diagnosis of a cancer. You don't need the worry of a cancer, that's not enough. You know, don't need to feel a, breath, a lump in your breast and be worried about it being breast cancer, that's not enough. You don't need to have your family doctor or your nurse practitioner say, I'm worried this might be cancer, we should investigate, that's not enough. So there's the, the journey for cancer really starts upstream and the cancer agency isn't involved. And similarly, the community oncology networks are, are really, really helpful because they do bring entities like chemotherapy much closer to home but again they're 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 like the regional health authority like warren was saying but really initiated by the bc cancer services the medical oncologists and the radiation oncologists but there's this whole area upstream where we've just talked about a lot in terms of screening but then there's the journey between an abnormal screen and everything that follows afterwards and it's like the abnormal screen where you're told, okay, your fit test was positive. Here's what happens next. Your mammogram showed a, some calcifications that look worrisome. Here's what happens next. There are some atypical cells that look like they might not be behaving on your pap smear. Here's what's happened next. And a lot of times it's um, an additional test, more mammograms, you know, um, a procedure by a gynecologist or by um, uh, another healthcare provider. It's going to get a, a surgical diagnosis. It's seeing a surgeon or other specialist. And then part of that is the weight. Part of it is understanding like, like how likely is this cancer? Part of it is the lack of like the, the transition between all these places. Why do you need another mammogram? Why do you need a MRI? Why do you need an ultrasound? Why do you need a biopsy? Why do you know? And so there's this big gap. The cancer journey for an individual is way beyond what we see at the cancer agency. And so how do we support that? And I think there's a significant role in the community 
as you as we support individuals and really help them navigate this really complex system that it becomes complex not only because there's a lot of new terms and things being thrown at the individual and their family but also in a time that is extremely anxiety provoking and very scary time even at the end if you're told guess what biopsy came back good news it's not cancer it doesn't erase the anxiety the stress and the experience of that journey and how do we support that entire journey i think i love the idea of having people in the community trained in terms of how to navigate that so that an individual is supported along the entire route um, and, and not left alone Great. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Uh, there is a comment and a couple of questions from Vanessa Charlong from Hoopachatset uh, First Nation. Firstly, saying, I think sometimes access to the fixed sites, for example, at hospitals, etc., comes down to parking, such as here in Fort Alberni. So I think that's a suggestion that it may be difficult parking, for example, the mama van uh, at, near the hospital in Port Alberni. And then later on in the chat, uh, she asks, uh, is there a way to have the mobile units reach out and set up a return visit two years after to reach their own recommendation of a screening every two years or set it up immediately after the visit? visit? Community shouldn't have to fight for a return visit as Jessica from Lil Watt was outlining earlier. And then just in addition to the Indigenous navigators, Vanessa asks, are there possible incentives, bursaries, funding to help get more Indigenous navigators? So that's a lot altogether, um, but we'll ask uh, if anyone has any thoughts on some of those questions that Vanessa has posed. Muted. Sorry, thanks. I'll, I'll tackle the first comment. Uh, they're all great and thought provoking for sure. So thanks so much, Vanessa. And then um, maybe pass it off to Warren. But all these things like parking, they're all real. Uh, and they're all things that we chip away at or we should chip away at to address them. So absolutely parking, I, I hear that the same for fixed mammography with community members and patients that I ultimately see uh, in the clinics uh, and see at community events. I just happened to bring it to my attention because of my role in cancer care um, and they wanna share their thoughts. Uh, another one that I've also heard to just give you an idea of things that are just all the little things that add up to big barriers. Um, the fixed mammography unit in Prince George uh, is not at the hospital, it's at a clinic. Um, now it's a clinic that actually, uh, well now it, it's sort of, it's moved. So now you can get it at the hospital, but it's at a place where there's also those kind of rules. Like if you are late or miss your ultrasound appointment or your gallbladder, you have to pay a $50 fee for it to be rescheduled. Now that's not related at all to cancer screening. There is no fee for a cancer screening. But these individuals are not told that. They're just sort of given like this standard kind of thing. You know, if you miss your appointment for your gallbladder um, ultrasound or your knee x-ray or like things that are unrelated, you have to pay a fee. But then it blocks these life-saving entities that are absolutely unrelated. Warren is here because the BC Cancer runs and has implemented runs and coordinates these screening programs. They are not regional and they are not done under the auspice of a certain hospital by a certain radiologist. They do not have the right to charge individuals fees or penalties because of other experiences in the healthcare system. But one of the things when we did that experience with the friendship centers, we did do um, engagement with the community members that came. And one of the biggest reasons that they gave for not having a mammogram that really surprised us, some of the big reasons we totally anticipated, but one I did not was I have an outstanding fee because I was late for a an ultrasound for my gallbladder, so I couldn't afford the $50 to get a mammogram. A complete misunderstanding and 
um, something that should be addressed so that individuals feel like they, they know that they have access to it, they have a right to it, that it's important and it should not be blocked. That's an example in addition to parking where there's all these kind of things that are on the plates and things that our community members, our family members have to get through even when they've decided, I want to get a mammogram, I know I should have a pap smear, I've decided to have the lung cancer screening. After all of that, and then all of a sudden these barriers start to come up that I think we need to really list down, deal with head on. Um, Warren, I'll pass it off to you because I know you're doing the work in the trenches with these community members to try to address these. Yeah, thanks. I totally agree. You know, the onus shouldn't be on communities to have to battle to get the van to go there or to schedule them. We should be taking that on. And so to that end, I'm hoping to build out the side of our team that focuses on community outreach and we call it Indigenous health promotion in a cancer context. But essentially, this role is meant to go to communities, talk about cancer, do presentations, facilitate the mobile van to go to communities, track where it's been, right? All of that work. Right now, I have one employee, but my, my plan is to have a team of individuals who would do exactly that, do all the heavy lifting meet communities where they're at, facilitate the van going there, working with our mobile screening team, doing all the things that you are currently doing now and shouldn't have to. So there are plans in place where we're hopefully going to shoulder that onus, and, but I totally agree. And I've been saying that internally as well, that we're making this way too hard for communities. It's no wonder that you know, we see participation the way it is and we hear the feedback that we do. And so, yeah, totally concur. And there's lots of conversations underway about changing that. And we should be taking that onus on. And hopefully we will. Great. Thanks, Warren. And just to maybe top off that discussion, Vanessa did add an ad additional comment saying lack of enough parking or the parking fees can be a deterrent to entering a site if people are already feeling apprehensive. Also poor bus systems and distance cost for taxis for those without transportation of their own can all play a part uh, and be a barrier to screening and other medical services. So thank you, Vanessa, for that comment. I'm just gonna scroll up and see where the next one was and uh, just make a note and maybe we can put this in the chat as well. Janice Angus had asked whether there was uh, an infographic or sheets information that could be shared that highlights the benefits of these tests, uh, of these different screening tests uh, in cancer prevention. Uh, and uh, she did find one at bccancer.bc.ca uh, backslash screening. And then Anar Dala from FNHA from uh, our surveillance team uh, put a couple of documents that are available on our FNHA website. Uh, if you look under FNHA cancer screening programs uh, or FNHA cancer screening, you'll find both a brochure and a flip book. Uh, so that information is available and can be distributed virtually, uh, or I guess prints can be made, prints offs can be made. Um, there is a comment in the Q&A from Crystal Todd that says, I'm sorry, this isn't really a question, but more of a comment of what Nadine uh, said. I'm a community health nurse sitting in for the health director, Jen Nelson. Um, I think that may have been um, reinforcing what, uh, what Dr. Caron had said earlier, but there is another comment uh, from Crystal Todd saying, I agree with what was said about having a place that is at home to get screening done, as I find that so many First Nations people are discriminated against the moment they, they walk in a hospital door by being asked what they had to drink today. No one wants to go to the hospital and be treated that way. And for sure, Crystal, uh, I think, you know, we, FNHA, we are all aware of the role, uh, the really serious negative impact that racism has upon our health and wellness uh, and definitely plays a role in people being reluctant to uh, both seek screening and seek care. Uh, I don't know at this point if 
uh, either Dr. Caron or Warren want to add to that or whether there are any initiatives ongoing in the anti-racism space or trying to increase cultural safety that we haven't mentioned already. I think, first of all, thank you, Crystal, for, for your thoughts and, and for sharing that. Um, I mean, there's efforts being made in, in multiple different venues and Warren's already uh, expressed how it's mandatory training now for those that are br brought into BC cancer. Um, I think we have a long way to go in the healthcare system. I think the In Plain Sight report, which demonstrated indigenous specific racism in BC's healthcare system is uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, but I think at least that there are initiatives underway. I can speak to uh, one of the programs as the First Nations Health Authority chair, and also as, uh, at, as a director at the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health at UBC. UBC currently, although not you know down the road, we're, we have SFU coming up, but we're currently the only medical school, uh, the only dentistry school, the only pharmacy school, the largest nursing school, and we also have social work, speech and audiology, medical genetics, physio, uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and you know, uh, dietetics. Like we have all these programs. And what we have worked with at UBC is to make uh, it mandatory to do our UBC 23-24 curriculum for first year students in these healthcare professions. And UBC 23-24 is basically not referring to the school year, but referring to calls to action 23-24, which actually referred to basically when it was released in 2015, it referred to it as cultural competency. We now know that we're aiming way above competency. We're aiming for cultural safety and humility. And this 23-24 program is aiming for UBC at least to do its part, to step up and say, if you wanna be a graduate in the health careers program and, and, and wanna leave UBC and actually work in this country, uh, then you better understand the history of Indigenous peoples in Canada, you better understand what Indigenous rights are, you better understand what the needs are and the expectations to provide culturally safe care. There's no guarantee that these courses will make someone do something, but I do, I am optimistic that they set a foundation for those who are not aware and didn't have the understanding or didn't have the, the, the training prior to that. I'm optimistic that a lot of people are, are enlightened and realize that they have a role way beyond memorizing anatomy, physiology, medications, uh, and how to interpret medical tests. I think, I think it will make a difference, but I'm, it needs to be tackled repeatedly from all angles. And, um, and that's just one we haven't mentioned today that we're doing. Thanks, Dr. Caron. And I think there are a couple of comments in the chat, um, specifically around people perhaps having some challenges uh, connecting with the screening uh, mammography van uh, to go to their community. There's a comment from Angela Nordstrom and from uh, Shelby Uzel. And I think what we can do is connect you um, with Warren after the webinar, uh, we have a, an email address for you that you connected to the Zoom with. So we'll make sure to connect you with. Um, and then we will skip over to a question from Arlene who asks, what about an MRI? Why do clients have to pay for this service? When is it waived to a no fee charge? And I don't know whether Arlene is still on the call and whether she wants to ask uh, more additional information, but I don't know whether or not uh, Dr. Caron or Warren uh, or even Tanya Duncan from our health benefits has any commentary on coverage for MRIs. Uh, it's, it's a pretty general question without knowing the specifics. Okay, Arlene's coming on, so that would be great. And while she does that, I'll just note we have about five minutes left in the Q&A portion. And if we don't get to your question, we absolutely commit 
uh, to providing me with an answer and we will follow up with everyone by email. Mm -hmm. Arlene, if you could go ahead. Arlene, are you able to connect? Oh, can't hear, so I will not comment. Okay, well, Arlene, if you want to email, um, if you want to email a question, for example, to the OCMO office, we can try to uh, get an answer to your question. Uh, we can maybe put that in the chat as well. Uh, and Nadine, you had your hand raised, so I'll turn to you. I can see that Arlene can comment through the chat. Arlene, are you referring to breast MRIs as one of the screening tools that is used sometimes? I, I may be able to comment on that if that's the question. I'm referring to all, okay. Um, it's, a, it's a broad question and I think maybe Tanya might be better served for that. Um, but I think I'm going to put I'm going to put it out there as as an example for the the complexity of screening. So, for example, breast MRIs are not indicated in any of those guidelines and the data that we looked at. But it is a very powerful breast cancer screening tool. But it is specifically identified to use for women who or men because men can get breast cancer who are at increased risk of breast cancer because of entities like um, um, gene mutations. Basically, they have such a strong family history. They see a genetic counselor, they see a medical geneticist, they get their DNA checked to see, are they at a really high risk of breast cancer? Because for example, high risk would be your mother had breast cancer in her thirties. Your brother had breast cancer and he's only two years older than you. Your father had breast cancer when he was 35. Those are really, really, really kind of high risk factors. And then breast MRIs work. And the reason why they work is because they're better than mammograms in people who are really young. And the breast MRIs are recommended in people who are really young in their 20s, in their 30s, before mammograms start to work, like we showed after the age of 40. Um, so that's sort of, uh, it's important to kind of note because if there's someone in your community, someone in your, like that, that has that kind of story, um, then maybe someone out there may benefit from me just bringing that up in the cancer context. Overall, I'll pass it to Tanya with respect to MRIs, because one of the things is MRIs are hard to come by. There's not too many communities, cities that have them. Uh, and so there's long waiting lists for them and long travel for most First Nation individuals in the, based on our demographics in the province to get to an MRI machine. So Tanya, I don't know if you wanna take it any further. Okay, it doesn't look necessarily like Tanya is currently available. So I think maybe what we could do is if um, we'll follow up with Tanya and see if she has any additional information to provide about MRIs from a health benefits point of view. And we will follow up with that question uh, for Arlene. Um, just in the minute or so that we have time left, I will say that I've noticed in the chat there's quite uh, a few questions and comments from people uh, just on how does one connect with the screening service, in particular the question around the mammograms van. Um, and so maybe at this at this last minute, I'll just turn to Warren and maybe just let everyone know, you know, how does a community um, know if they're kind of on the list for the mammogram van coming around or how do they reach out? What, what would be the starting point for them? Yeah, thanks. I know there's lots of concerns around this and we've had cancellations and whatnot. So we have three vans <clears throat> and they're each uh, run a bit differently. They do their own scheduling. So we have one that does North and Lower Mainland. We have one that does Interior Kootenai. And then we have another that does Vancouver Island and Vancouver Coastal. 
And so they'll each have different booking teams. And so I can follow up with contact information, but hopefully our team will play a coordinating role because uh, some of our booking folks are still in their early days of learning. But I would hope that it would go through us, <clears throat> right? And I know there's challenges too in, in the booking process. The vans have been having mechanical issues. We've got staffing issues. That's why I'm really hoping that our team will play more of a central role moving forward in facilitating these vans to go to communities us doing most of the heavy lifting and the coordinating. We have a checklist, as you imagine, in government where we've got to meet all these things, you know, and so yeah, there's there are barriers for sure. But I think that with support and by working collaboratively, we can get the vans to go to those communities eventually, right? I mean, we're, we're going to blow up the guidelines, right? New guidelines around access with First Nations communities in mind. And so there's work already underway. But for now, I would suggest going through our team and then we will help connect you with the right booking folks for each of the vans. And hopefully that will go fairly seamless. But again, lots of work underway uh, to help improve communication from the mobile teams. Great, thanks Warren. I think that's really helpful. Um, so we have now reached the end of the question and answer portion of this town hall. And I do want to thank each and every person who either put a question or a comment in the chat. Uh, the presentation actually ended up uh, ending early, so we had more time for Q&A, which is actually terrific because sometimes we tend to run out of time to answer everyone's questions, and we still didn't answer every single question. So again, just want to reiterate that we have copied all of the questions uh, from the chat and we will follow up directly with the people who asked uh, by email following this town hall. And uh, the other thing I guess I wanna just say briefly is a uh, big thanks uh, to Dr. Caron and to Warren for uh, carrying most of the presentation and the question and answer period. Uh, this information is certainly uh, needed and wanted by communities. Uh, and it's good to see that we are, you know, starting our journey to uh, both being able to provide better screening for First Nations people, and hopefully that will result in better health outcomes uh, as time moves forward. So uh, on behalf of FNHA, we are pleased that we'll be able to use the findings from Dr. Caron's data linkage research to improve cancer outcomes for First Nations people in BC by refreshing the Indigenous Cancer Strategy. And for all of the presenters uh, and for the people who asked questions and provided comments and information, just thank you for participating and sharing your wisdom. So we'll turn now for closing remarks for some of our leaders. And first, uh, I'll turn to Dr. Sheila Blackstock. Again, she is the chair of the FNHA board. Sheila? Thank you so much, Dr. Wellman, Wyman's for me. I'd really like to express our gratitude to yourself and the Office of the Chief Medical Officers and the BC Cancer Agency as well for providing us with this really important information so we can continue to work in partnerships with our uh, three pillars, uh, the Health Council, the Health Directors, and the First Nations Health Authority improve the cancer journey for First Nations people in BC and eradicate cancer. Well, I'd like to thank each one of you for taking the time out of your day and your busy schedules to join us in Hamaya. Thank you very much. Back over to you. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Blackstock. And we'll turn to Wade Grant if he's still with us on the town hall. Okay, Wade probably has uh, had to move on to a different meeting. Uh, so we'll turn to Keith, please. Keith? Thank you. Thank you, Nell. Um, just want to thank, that was an amazing presentation. Data is so important. And it was, um, thank you, Dr. Carroll, for an amazing presentation. It really brings this to reality of the series that, that cancer has on our communities. And the power of data is strengthening our shared mission for improving uh, First Nations wellness through health transformation in BC. As health directors, we are tasked with managing health and wellness throughout, this, throughout the province. 
and these services grow and change, we must ensure that the data we collect reflects the true needs and experience of First Nations community members. The data shared today about cancer screening will enable First Nations and health governance partners to advocate for better resources and to develop intentions that are relevant to First Nations people. And this leads to improved health comes improved health come, outcomes and lives saved. And thank you again for Sequalia for opening us this important discussion. And to you, Dr. Wyman, and the Office of the Chief Medical Officer for presenting the data on cancer screening in the First Nations in BC. And on behalf of our association, I look forward to their continued collaboration using cancer data, cancer data to create policy strategies and health system that truly respond to the needs of the First Nation communities. So again, thank you for this presentation and um, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Wyman. Great, thanks Keith. Uh, and again, I just wanna reiterate uh, that you know, our role in the Office of the Chief Medical Officer is to serve as watchmen and to provide uh, BC First Nations with the information they need uh, to make decisions and develop programs and services around uh, achieving better health outcomes. So it's an honor to serve in this role. Um, just to remind you before we close with Elder Sequalia, uh, that a recording of this webinar will be available both on our FNHA website and our YouTube channel. There has also been a question in the chat around will people get a copy of the presentation? And yes, we will ensure that a copy of the slides are available. Uh, and then again, to remind you, if we weren't able to get to your question, uh, we will certainly follow up with you with an email response. Um, and so that being said, I will soon turn over to Elder Sequalia and just let people know uh, that as soon as Elder uh, Sequalia is finished uh, with her closing, the webinar will end, so it won't return to the room. So take care, everybody. Uh, take care of yourselves and your families and your community members. And remember to get up to date on your cancer screenings. Uh, take care. Over to you, Sequalia. It sounds like it's been a um, good um, gathering, and I'm hoping you can hear me. Can you? Yes. Yep. Okay, because someone's phoning me, and I'm like, ah, not right now. No. I'm going to do Co-Salish Anthem and um, ask you all to come together, one heart and one mind, and remember. Leonard George and his words that this was his father's spirit song that he gifted to FNHA and sing along and while we sing pray for your family friends and communities ready oh he Oh, he loves he loves Ah, 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 ah. 
So to know up and man man squawin to squiles deceits, asking you, Creator, to watch over all your children gathered here today and all of um, their family, friends, and communities, asking you to help us all with our squall and feelings in our hearts and minds and our total being, emotional, physical, and spiritual health and wellness. Asking you to hear our prayers for all our family and friends, any health issues, all of those who have traumas and battles with alcohol and drugs, whether it's supply, and all of those anxiety and depression, and also prayers for all the homeless who are there because of their traumas and battles and uh, health issues. Asking you, Creator, to hear our prayers for all our family, friends, and communities who have lost love, that our prayers um, hold them up. Um, as they say farewell and in the healing days. And always remember our loved ones, no more pain or health issues or material worries. Their only worry is about us and left here in the land. Of, and they become what I call our spirit guardian warriors. Because my elders said they watch over us and protect us as best they can. And lift us up by sending us signs. And so know we're alone. Safely and let them have a re good rest of the day and week. Tama Kwetsi Snechum. Those are my words. See you all soon. <laughs>